Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I welcome all of you to our worship service this morning. It's a little foggy still outside, but it's a wonderful feeling to be here in the sanctuary. So I greet all of you who are here and all who are watching online. The deacon this morning is Jim Bennett. He'll be right back. And I'm glad to say that Beth Anderson and Elfie Hummel have uh, been working as greeters this morning. You can find an order of worship. This is the good news. You can find an order of worship for this morning's service on the church website. Uh, those of you who've been watching online and been doing that for a while, you know exactly how to do it. Those of you who are here, you have a bulletin in your hands. This is the bad news. I need to tell you that the second lesson in your bulletin is the wrong lesson. Therefore, I need to tell you that I gave the wrong information to Julie. And when she gave me the bulletin that she had prepared and that was all set to run off, I looked at it and said, fine. So the second lesson, instead of being from the first chapter of the book of Acts should be from the 11th chapter. Instead of being verses 1 to 11, it should be 1 to 18. So you are welcome to look it up. It's on page 1273. I'll mention that again when we get there. Uh, and my apologies to all of you. Um, I want to let everyone know that there is a special announcement at the end of the worship service uh, today. You may have noticed we're not really announcing about the license that we use for reproducing music anymore, but in that slot following the postlude, I have a brief special announcement this morning. I'm sure by that time, the whole place will smell like pancakes and sausages, and I realize the announcement has to be succinct and clear, and it will be. I um, want to thank uh, Jim Bennett. Oh, here he is. I want to thank Jim Bennett for this delicious glass of water he just brought me. And also for serving as the deacon for this morning's worship service. Gary Snowbeck, our organist. Jeffrey Hutchins, director of music. Carly Etter, coordinator of ministry to children. To Julie Schweikert, who does her best to prepare the bulletin, regardless of the questionable people she has to work with. <clears throat> and to Joan Bennett, who's operating the camera this morning. I want you now to take a deep breath. And I want you to pay attention to where you are. Not so much the space as the time. Some of you know that reading in the scriptures, you can begin to find a distinction between the kind of time that we spend so much effort to organize and control and keep up with, ordinary time, chronos, and God's time, which is called Kairos. The space in which we gather now is part of God's time. I want you to pay attention to what you feel in this moment, to your appreciation for those who gather with you, to your sense of comfort and familiarity and gratitude to be in this moment of this day and this week. I want you to pay attention to the sense that you have not only of God's presence, but of God's attention to you. I want you to pay attention not only to the gifts that the Holy Spirit brings, but to the joy and to the love of God with which those gifts 
are brought to you. Whoever you are or wherever you are in life's journey, you are welcome in our worship service this morning. Thank you. I invite you to rise as you're able and join in singing our opening hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, number 333.
Please join me in the responsive call to worship found in your order of service. God has made this day. Let us rejoice and be glad. The God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead raises us to new life daily. Thanks be to God. Glory, Glory be, be to God, God our Creator, Creator, to Jesus our risen Christ, and, Christ, and to the Spirit our Comforter. Comforter. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together for peace. Let, Let us, us open, open our, our hearts, hearts to the love of God. Let, Let us break, break open the doors and let the stranger in. Let, Let us embrace, embrace rich and poor, the beautiful and the bruised, both tears and laughter, for God's arms are wide, and in her there is no stranger. Let us walk the way of the open heart. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Please join with me in the unison prayer of invocation. New, New every, every morning, morning is your mercy, O God. O God. Your, your faithfulness, faithfulness is as boundless as the heavens. heavens. We, we gather, gather to worship you, thankful, thankful for all your gifts. We, we thank, thank you that, that Jesus in dying and rising for us, has delivered us from the power of sin and death. Free us to accept the new life Christ offers us through your presence among us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let us continue together in prayer, offering the words our Lord has given us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The first lesson this morning is taken from the Gospel according to John, reading from the 13th chapter, beginning at the 31st verse. Listen for the word of God. When he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. The second lesson this morning is taken from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, reading from the 11th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Again, you can find this in the Pew Bible on page 1273. Now the apostles and the brothers and sisters who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why do you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter. 
kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you're able and join in singing our hymn, Though I May Speak, number 372. I asked you to pay attention to where we are together right now. We're here because this is our practice, because we are called and invited to join together in worship. 
And this morning, it's likely that many of us come to this time of worship, to this time of singing and seeking God's wisdom, feeling God's love. It's likely that we come with heavy hearts this morning, having heard the news from Buffalo, news that perhaps came to us as it did to me in a series of beeps on my telephone, or perhaps on the radio or in the newspaper, a tragic shooting that has left 10 people dead, which seems to be motivated by hatred and a desire to reject and exclude others on the basis of their race or their ethnic identity. Maybe this is the best place we can be together in that set of circumstances. Let us pray. Holy God, we have come to listen for your word today, to open our hearts to you in prayer, to seek the calm and the peace and the love with which you can lift and warm our spirits. We come this morning with an extra burden of sadness, of, of terrible, senseless violence, filled with wondering about what it means and how to respond, and conscious of the irreparable harm and loss of a community in Buffalo, of numerous families, of public officials and emergency responders. It's not unusual, O oh God, that we have to listen for you beyond and above and in the midst of other noise. Speak to us this morning, calm us, hold us. Let us feel your presence and take confidence in the movement of your spirit. We pray in the name of the one who comes, Jesus Christ. Amen. So this morning, once again, the lectionary leads us to that curious sense of time in Eastertide, in the weeks following Easter. The not yet, almost, already sense of the resurrection, of the beloved community of those who would follow Jesus, of discipleship and the great commission to invite discipleship among all the nations of the world. The gospel lesson from the 13th chapter of John comes from a section that is called, often by scholars, the farewell discourse, a section that, in which Jesus is sharing with the disciples what it is that will come and trying to prepare them for the time when they won't be present to each other bodily anymore as they've been so accustomed. In four verses, Jesus says three important things. The first is that the time of the glorification of the Son of Man and the glorification, glorification of God has come. The glory of each reflects on the other. 
In the glorification of the Son of Man, of Jesus, God is glorified. And in the glorification of God, Jesus is glorified. And it touches on an underlying theme in John's gospel, which is that Jesus and God are one. And then Jesus says very clearly that it is time for departure, for separation. I am with you only a little longer, he says. Where I am going, you cannot come. Similar to the other Gospels, this conversation takes place around the table. What we call the Last Supper in the Gospel, according to John, it's not the Passover meal, but it's before Passover. And Jesus speaks to his friends, those who have followed him, little children, he calls them. Perhaps giving a sense of the need for their faith to grow. And the third thing that Jesus says to them is that he has a new commandment for them. To love one another. To love one another as Jesus has loved them. This love that they have for each other that reflects the love of Jesus will be a sign. It will be the means by which the whole world can recognize disciples in their midst by the love that they have forever for each other. Now you should know that in the verses right before this passage, Jesus has told the gathering that one of them will betray him. And he actually says to Simon Peter in this gospel version who it is that it's Judas Iscariot and Judas leaves the room at that time. Right after this passage, Jesus has a conversation with Peter who doesn't want to be separated from Jesus, wants to do whatever he can not to be separated. And Jesus tells him that Peter will betray him three times before the next morning. So just think about the context of this commandment to love each other set right alongside betrayal and rejection and right alongside denial, weakness, fear. But the commandment is to love each other as Jesus has loved them. To love each other as Jesus has loved us. The second lesson, the real second lesson, talks about the growth of the community of Jesus' followers. In the previous chapter in the book of Acts, Cornelius was introduced. Cornelius is a Roman centurion. That means he's a Roman soldier who commands a hundred other soldiers. He's from a group known as the Italian cohort, and he's from the town, the city of Caesarea, which was mostly a Gentile city north of Jerusalem along the coast. And the lesson today explains that Cornelius is the first actual, demonstrable, undisputed 
Gentile, non-Jew, to join the community of those who are following Jesus. The passage is a description by Peter offered to the council of disciples in Jerusalem in defense of what he has done that has upset them so much that Gentiles had somehow accepted the word of God. And in contrast to other times when we've listened to Peter speak, he's very calm and deliberate, and he explains clearly and slowly exactly what happened. He describes a vision in which a sheet descends from heaven, and when it opens up, it's filled with all kinds of animals that are all not kosher, not acceptable to eat, all unclean, profane, nothing that Peter has ever touched or or wanted to eat before. And God's command is, kill and eat, Peter. Peter refuses. And God says, That which God has made clean, you must not call profane. Now, just to make sure that the point gets home, the vision happens three times. Seems like everything happens to Peter three times. He denies three times. Then he has to tell Jesus he loves him three times. Now he has to have a sheet full of who knows what to come down so God can explain to him what the boundaries of belonging are. Just what the boundaries of faithful versus profane or clean versus unclean, just where the boundaries are set for who is to be welcomed and included and loved. Paul says, next three men show up asking that Jesus go with them to Caesarea. And the Spirit tells him that he should go, and not only that, but he should take the friends who are with him along. Jewish friends, the ones who are going to tell on him afterwards. And so he goes to house, the house of Cornelius, who tells the group that he has seen an angel, which has told him to send to Joppa in order to to have Peter come to his house so that his whole household can be saved. And Peter explains to the council that as he began to speak, to tell them about Jesus and Jesus' teaching, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon these disciples. Just as it had been promised by Jesus. Wait in Jerusalem for God's promise. And so Peter's reaction is if the Holy Spirit fills these people just the same way as it did me and all of you, the same gift comes upon them that came upon us in believing in the Lord Jesus Christ Peter says, who am I to get in God's way? And this is what it sounded like. Silence. There wasn't any way to argue around what Peter said. It was obvious to everyone. It was uncomfortable, but
but it was obvious. And the passage says that then, out of the stunned silence, they praised God. That God had given to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to new life. To the Gentiles, the most unlikely. The ones most easily dismissed, disregarded, excluded, rejected, left out, not invited. If you read through the book of Acts, there's an amazing thing that you can notice. It's the story of the growth of the local church. And so again and again, there are stories of Peter or of Paul or of Stephen or of other disciples sharing Jesus' message, inviting people to believe inviting them to open their lives to the grace of Jesus Christ. And if you read those stories, there's usually some teaching about Jesus and there's usually the power of the Holy Spirit and there's usually baptism. But they never have in the same sequence. It's not really true that people have to be told and taught about Jesus so that then they can be baptized so that then the Holy Spirit will fill them. Sometimes, like Peter described, the Holy Spirit just fills people and makes it clear that baptism is just going to be the celebration of confirmation of this event. And it's very clear that some that the disciples encounter have already been taught, have already had visions, have already received knowledge of the power and the grace of Jesus. The knowledge has gotten there before the disciples The Holy Spirit hasn't really come along as something that the disciples only can bring. The Holy Spirit goes where it wants. The Holy Spirit gives power to whom it will, reflecting the love of God. And so as we consider the consternation of these Jewish followers of Jesus, whose whose faithful living has always included attention to a set of rules that made clear distinctions between who was to be welcome and who was not, who one could talk to and who one could not, who one could eat with alongside of and who one could not. Because of the danger of taking on the sinfulness or the waywardness or the, or the lostness of some of those people. But in the 12th chapter of Genesis, at the very beginning of the Bible, We're reminded that God told Abraham, by you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. All the families. Not all the circumcised families. Not all the handsome, beautiful, well-educated families. All the families. So our call as a community is to extend welcome to all. And it's the testimony of the gospel and certainly of the book of Acts that it's not always easy to do that. 
The passage suggests that we're part of a community in which the Holy Spirit is likely to lead us in a direction that we hadn't anticipated and that's not necessarily comfortable. If the call is to love one another as Jesus has loved us, then that's a love that is extravagant, without limit, without border. It's a love that we need to ask help to live and express. Loving each other for those who gathered with Jesus around the table that night eventually met, meant being in that council where disciples argued back and forth about whether the people that Peter had let in anyone else was going to talk to. And that's not the end of it, right? In this community, in earlier times, we've had difficult conversations. Difficult conversations like, should women be able to have positions of leadership and be ordained to ministry in the church? Should children be allowed to receive communion when they probably can't understand what it means. Should gay and lesbian people be welcomed into the fellowship, be ordained as leaders, be included as loving and energetic and spirit-filled members of the community? This church is part of a tradition that in its history has made a practice of inviting others. This church is part of a denomination that's made up of four denominations that joined together because they decided that the things that were different between them were far less important than what they shared in faith and devotion. None of us has to look very far or try very hard to find plenty of examples of, of disagreement, and not just disagreement, but, but rude and disrespectful confrontation. Not just disagreement, but, but belittling and rejection and dismissal in our community and in our nation. And what does it mean to say that all are welcome and to listen to Jesus say, love each other as I have loved you? What does that mean about how we live? Not only when we're here together in the sanctuary or here together on the other side of a camera and a screen, But when we're out and about at the grocery store, at the gas station, in one of those long, slow lines, two lines over from a mother who's dealing with a disruptive and unruly and willful child when she's obviously tired and fraught. How do we live as neighbors two doors down from someone who is aged and isolated 
and lonely. We surely can't do it ourselves. So let's agree and commit that we will ask God for the help that we need. That we'll depend on the Holy Spirit. To enable us to respond in love and concern and welcome and faith, even in times of difficulty and disagreement and strife. Love one another as Jesus has loved you. Amen. Invite us now to a time of prayer. I want to begin and express my gratitude and my joy in the flowers that are given this morning by Carol Mitchell, celebrating the birthday of her granddaughter, Kellen Marie Mitchell, turning 22 years old today. She'll graduate from the University of Tennessee next weekend, and Carol's very proud of her. And she also, with the same flowers, celebrates her grandmother, Beulah Stevens, born on May the 15th, 1894, passed away on April the 18th, 1974, celebrating Grandmother Beulah's kind and gentle spirit and the memories that Carol remembers sharing with her. We want to lift up in our prayers those who are named in our order of worship, praying for Linda Shannon and Marsha Folds, for Lorraine Burge, for Marlene Bolaño and Shirley Ryan and Joyce Bolaño, for Ellen Robert and Treffel Robert. We wish a happy birthday this morning to Jack Corcoran and tomorrow to Drew Mastracchio and the day after that to Todd Shea. And the day after that, to Scott Geisler. And after that, to Cynthia Geisler, Shirley Ryan. And after that, to Dot Pierce, George Gladkowski, and Jody Gallagher. Happy birthday, all of you. And we wish a very, very happy wedding anniversary to John and Linda Rankin. We want to lift up in our prayers those among our congregation and our acquaintances who are living with cancer, And so we offer prayers for Elaine Smith, for Nolan and Janet, for Chris and Roy and Joseph Basivius, for Anna, for Jordan and her father, for Misty and Debbie Roberts, for Karen and Annie. We lift up prayers that remission will continue for Sarah Gladkowski, for Jake Smith, for Rich Baldino. And we want to offer prayers of joy that Ron Bicknell is doing much better as he recovers from liver transplant surgery. So we give thanks to God for the blessings of the opportunity for a transplant, for successful surgery, for full recovery, for new life. I ask that we lift up in our thanksgiving for the life of Paul Burns, who's the father of Bonnie Sandell, wife of a colleague of mine who died on May the 5th. I also ask that we hold in our prayers Mark Narducci, a brother of a friend of mine who's critically ill in upstate New York with uh, COVID. Joyce Manzo asks that we lift up prayers for Ted, her husband. Ted has a case of shingles affecting the right side of his face. He's lost the hearing uh, in his right ear. So we want to pray for his recovery and particularly that the medications that he has will help him feel more comfortable. Carla Hill is traveling to California where the memorial service 
for her brother Brian James and his interment will be held on Wednesday of this week. So she asks for prayers for her travels and for the worship service um, for sunny days. And Joanne Nottingham asks that we give thanks for the life of her dear friend Brian Lizotti, who died unexpectedly on April the 24th. So we give thanks for the precious life of Brian and in particular for his sense of humor and the laughs that he shared with so many people. We ask God's comfort for Brian's son, Blake, Blake's mother, Dee, and for all of Brian's friends. And Joanne also asks that we lift up prayers for another friend's twin brother, Anthony, who has stage four cancer. So we lift up our prayers for Anthony and for all of his family and friends. And of course, we want to hold in our prayers the people of Buffalo, particularly the people in the neighborhood right around the Topps supermarket where the tragedy happened yesterday, for the lives that have been lost and for the lives that have been changed irreparably by those events. We pray for first responders. We pray for public officials. We pray for all of those who go to offer comfort and assistance and presence in the midst of tragedy. Let's be in our prayer in silence. O God, most holy, we give you thanks as we're gathered in worship this morning. Thanks in particular for this moment of prayer as we open our hearts to your healing, to your mercy, to your gifts of life and love, of hope and new beginning. We lift up to you those whom we have named and the other names that are on our minds and our hearts, praying for healing, praying for strength and courage, praying for loving presence and encouragement in the midst of loneliness. We pray in the aftermath of tragedy and in the midst of trauma that will go on and unfold that your life and your love and your light might be felt and seen and heard and held tightly in the weeks and months to come. A commandment to love as you have loved seems surely overwhelming and impossible, except that we know we can ask for your help. We can recognize that it's your love that empowers and enables and is the foundation for our love. And so we ask that you will fill us to overflowing with love and that we might depend on your trustworthy presence your unhesitating love, and your deep wisdom. Help us to be the disciples you see and know we can be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now I invite you, if you will, to stand and join in celebrating this morning's offering.
Gracious God, we ask your blessing upon the tangible expressions of our joy and our care. Renew in us a sense of our abundance in all times and a never-failing compassion for all who need hope. For we pray in the spirit of Jesus Christ, who is the source of our hope and our joy, of our gifts and our open hands. Amen. Now I invite you to join in a greeting of peace. Join Jim and me in a greeting of peace and to carry that with you through this week. May the the peace peace of God God in Jesus Christ Christ be be with you always. always. Amen. I invite you to join in singing our closing hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West. And I remind you that I have an important announcement following the postlude. Thank you. As it is a gift that we may serve God, let us go forth now, accepting the ministry to which each one is surely called, rejoicing in the blessing of our Creator God, continually renewed in the life of Jesus Christ, and hoping in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, be led out in joy. Amen. You may be seated. Amen.